All right, gentlemen, we are on turn to um, Perak Lamed Pasuk Aleph. Perak Lamed Pasuk Aleph. Page. Uh, what page are we on here? 1088. Uh, no, 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 a little, lo- a little further. Page 1090. Okay. So it says like this. This is a little bit, it needs an explanation. So the Torah says, "Vehaya ki avo alecha." Three lines at the top. "Vehaya ki avo alecha hadvorim aela habrocha veaklolo." When these things come, the blessing and the curse, "Asher nasati lefanecha," which I have placed before you, that's a blessing and the curse that we're talking about in Parshas. Uh, what do you call it? In Parshas Kisavo. "Vashevos elav avecha." You will take to your heart. You will take take the matter to heart, as the expression goes. You'll take the matter to heart, page 10, 1090. And what do you do with it? You'll return to Hashem, your God. I mean, the exile and all the calamities were a result of misdeeds. And so when you go through the blessing and the curse... So then you will take it to heart and you'll obey God. You and your children with all your heart and all your soul. That's what the Torah says over here. Anything bothering you? Something should be bothering you here. Something pretty basic should be bothering you here. Again, the Torah says, well, when all the blessing and the curse that I mentioned earlier in the previous parsha, there was blessing if you're good, curse if you're bad, and you'll take it to heart when you're out there in the exile. And then you'll come back and you'll do tshuva as a result of it. Nothing about that bother you? It's assuming that we're assuming that we make mistakes. Correct. Assuming that you went into exile because you made mistakes. It's all based on that. It's assuming we were in exile. Assuming we made mistakes. Assuming we're. That, that, that's not the question. The question is assuming you've made mistakes and assuming you went into exile and assuming you went through the calamities and the blessing and the curse. It's gonna it's gonna motivate you. You'll take it to heart. And then you're gonna then you're gonna come back down. Nothing about that bother you. Judge us favorably. Judge us favorably. Well, the guy was worshiping idols. He was on his knees kissing an idol, worshiping idols, murdering people, committing adultery. We'll judge him favorably. He was having a bad day. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. no. We're, we're assuming again. You're you're asking a different question. You're asking how does the Torah know in advance what's going to be? We're not we talking about. Know that they know. But that's not what we're talking about. That we're talking about when this actually comes to be. When the Torah is saying, assuming it happens, assuming it happens, and assuming you were bad, and assuming you went into exile, assuming, assuming, assuming. Then the Torah says, what's going to happen is that you will then take it to heart, and you will do tshuva. You'll, you'll, hopefully you'll take it to heart, and you'll do tshuva. That's what the Torah says is the pattern that should happen. I'm asking you, is there something about what the context here says that should, something should bother you here? Something should bother you. Page 10, 10, 1090. Something should bother you. What bothers the before? I'll tell you what bothers the before ship. Then you'll tell me if it bothers you. When do tshuva people uh, tend to start repenting? When things are going well or when things are going poorly in life? When do people, what's that? When calamities happen, all of a sudden, then a person, oh boy, you know, I better, I better get my act together over here. Things aren't going so well. So why does the Torah say, when the blessing and the curse comes. Why does the Torah say when the blessing and the curse comes? Why does the Torah just say when the curses come, then you're going to get then you're going to get your act together? Why does the Torah talk about when the blessing and the curse come? What the blessing got to do with any of this? Most people, people very very seldomly, does a guy get rich and do tshuva? You can get rich and do mitzvahs. But a guy who gets rich, very so say, you know, that's why they, they say when, when something bad happens, people say, "Why me?" When a guy when a guy no when a guy wins the lottery, nobody ever breaks down crying and saying, "Why me?" When I win the lottery, Mirza Hashem, should be soon. Say amen, and a lot of money. Say amen. And my reaction is going to be not "Why me?" My reaction is "Why did it take so long?" That's what my reaction is going to be. <laughs> you know, like, like, well, why not sooner? You know, well, what, what, what kind of, who, who gets rich and does some, so, uh-oh, I had a good day in the stock market, I better do some soul searching. 
Very few people do that. You have a bad day on the stock market, then you do some soul searching. First you shoot your broker, then you do some soul searching for having murdered him. Right? But you do some soul searching, right? Yeah, yeah. So why is the bracha over here? So there are different approaches. Approach number one is when people, uh, 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 when you feel the pain greater when you've been lifted, where do you feel the pain when you when, when you fall off when you fall off a five for, for five a height of five feet, or when you fall off a height of twenty feet, right? It's 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 a worse fall. So sometimes what a kosher does to create more pain, a person who has the money and loses the money, that's devastating. I never had the money, so he did. He, okay, is that fun with the not have money? But when you had money and you lose it, that's devastating. That's devastating. People who were wiped out in what was it two thousand eight. When was the crash? 2008. People were wiped out. They were devastated. I, there's some people who couldn't be wiped out because they didn't have anything to wipe out. But there are other people. The other people get they get wiped out. You had it and you lost it. So sometimes the blessing is there in order to feel the pain more, so that a person will be motivated to do tshuva. Because at the end of the day, the whole goal of suffering is to get us to do tshuva. The whole goal of exile is to get us to get our exile. Look around, see what we're going through. The goal of what we're going through in Israel right now is not to go and target kill various Hezbollah leaders. It's not the goal. It may be, you know, warms the heart. But that's not the goal. The goal isn't to go and, and, and bomb uh, launchers in Lebanon. That's not the goal. The goal of whatever's going on is that we should say, Rabbi so we're in trouble, help us out. That's the goal. And if you think that there's really something they could do about the situation, then you, then, then you don't understand the situation. There's nothing they could do about it. These guys got missiles that could reach all over the place. And when they knocked out, now they're estimating, after all the, after all the noise, and the United States first said, well, they've set back his ball of 20 years. And then another report came out, they've only knocked out 10% of their capabilities. How's that to motivate us to do some tshuva? And that's with all the bombing and everything else. The goal of the suffering, in life in general, the goal of suffering is for a person to, the Gemara and Bracha says, if a person sees he's suffering, you fashion do some soul searching. If you see you're going through a hard time, do some soul searching. And the goal, by the way, is not to determine why, I told you, it, we're, not, we're not prophets. We're a non-profit, right? We are a non-profit. We're not prophets. We don't have Ruach HaKodesh. If something happens, let's say a guy's car gets stolen. You come out in the morning, your car is missing. If you're in Brooklyn, you're, I heard once a guy in Brooklyn came out, his front step was missing. <laughs> guy, somebody stole the front step in Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah. Welcome to New York. Right? Somebody, somebody stole the front step. Right? So you walk up in the morning in your car. But in most normal cities, only your car goes. Yeah, at least you have something to walk over to your car with. In Brooklyn, the, the step is missing. So you, you wake up in the morning, your car is stolen. So you got to do some soul searching. I, I, maybe, I, maybe I haven't given people rides enough. Maybe I haven't, uh, what do you call it? Maybe I'm not so kosher in my business dealings. The bottom line is, I don't know why. I can't say, yes, it must be because of my kosher. How do you know? How do you know? Maybe it's because you ignore people, you don't give people rides. Maybe it's because you talk in shul. I don't know how God works. I don't know, what, I don't know what, how things work. But what it gets us to do is at least think what it could be. That's the goal. What could it be? Oh, you know what? I haven't been giving people rides. I've actually been going like this when they're outside in the rain, and I had to kind of drive past. I enjoy that. And the, uh, what do you call it? I know that, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, there was that, that guy that I ripped off in business. Oh, and that guy, too. Oh, and that guy, too. I got me thinking about that. Oh, and there's also, I do talk in shul. I don't know what it is, and it could be none of the above. It could be I don't honor my parents properly. I don't know how God works. My parents have carried me my whole life. The car carries me. There's a, some, there's a connection. I don't know how God works. The bottom line is it gets me thinking. That's what tshuva is supposed to do. So one of the benefits, by the way, that's why you ever notice Haman rose to a high position. All anti-Semites in Jewish history rise to a high position and then they fall. Why? Because it hurts more. It hurts more when you're in a high position. That's one of the paybacks for them. They're put there in order to motivate us, to cattle prod us into the right path. That's their job. Their job is to get the Jewish people to do tshuva. Haman goes and he torments the Jewish people. All of a sudden the Jewish people are fasting, they're doing Jewish. That's his job. But he, nobody asked him to do it. He's doing his job well. He wasn't, Haman chose to do that, so he's going to get punished. When does he get punished? First, of course, Baruch promotes him. He becomes the vice president of the world. 
and then boink, he falls. It hurts more. When you drop, when you raise high, it hurts more. That's the first idea of the bracha in the klala, number one. Number two, I heard about a guy, there was this, uh, the head of the prison, the Israeli prison, uh, prison authority, the head of the, the they call him the, the, the Shabbat, Shab, what's it called? Yes, Shabbat. No, not the, not the, not, the, the, the prisons, the prison, the Shabbat, right? Shirut bet so the head of the the head of the prisons was once at a he met a rav, so met a certain rabbi, and he said to this rav, "Listen, we got a we got a problem. We got a guy in jail here in Israel. He won't give his wife a legal divorce. He won't give her a get. the hal- The law in Israel is the halacha. First of all, is that if a bezdin paskins that a man has to give his wife a get, he has to give her a get." Let's say he is not, uh, what do you call it? he's not supporting her, or he is physically abusive, or he's some uh, committed a, a, what do you call it? he's been unfaithful. There are grounds for a woman to go to Bezin and say, I want to get a get, and Bezin will pass and he has to give her a get. Okay. In the time of the Sanhedrin, back in the day, they could actually use corporal punishment to get a guy to give a get. If a guy refused to give a get to his wife, he refused to divorce her, so they can bring him into, they could bring in the Bayesden enforcer, who happens to be a, what do you call it, he, he, he doubles as a linebacker for one of the Big Ten teams, and this is his side job, is whipping people in Bayesden, and as soon as he comes walking into the room, uh, the guy will probably soften up a little bit, and then he starts applying some physical therapy, and at a certain point, the guy says, okay, I'll give her a get, I'll give her a get, that works. Nowadays, we don't have that option. What do they do? The state of Israel, the secular state, has an arrangement with the courts. If the court ever decides a man has to give his wife a get and he won't, they will imprison him until he gives the get. They put a man in prison. There was actually a case here in Israel where a man died in prison 20 years. He was in prison. He refused to give his wife a get. He said, I'll rot before I give her a get. Apparently, he felt that she had done certain things which are generally uh, not appropriate. Uh, I'm not talking about burning the toast either. And uh, so he, he said, all right, and he died in prison. And after 20 years that he died in prison, she had a sitchiva because they're still married. And she was true. She wasn't religious. She was traditional. I remember seeing the thing in the paper. She's sitting there like this, like, I got to do this for this jerk over here. For, and she, was, she felt bound by the idea of sitting shiva. So she, so she was upset. Okay. So, this, so the guy came to this rough and he said, I got a guy in prison who won't give his wife a get. He's been in prison for, 40, for a few years. And he refuses to give his wife a get. What should I do? So the Rav said to the, get, to the head of the prisons, I, you know what the problem is? I, what I want you to do is I want you to free him from prison. Free him from prison for three months. Let him go for three months. Then take him back to prison. So he freed him for three months. Maybe about six months. I've heard a story. He freed him. Frees the guy. They bring him back to prison after six months. And within a couple of days, he gave his wife a get. What happened? He had gotten used to the situation of being in prison. He'd gotten used to it, so he felt no urgency. Once he tasted freedom again, like, whoa, then he put him back in prison. Oh, oh I forgot how bad prison is. And so, so at that point, he writes to get. At that point, he's a good guy. So the Torah says, you know what, sometimes, sometimes you know, you're suffering. And you don't even appreciate to say, sometimes people get used to the suffering. So Akosho throws in a little bracha. He throws in a little bracha, oh, things are a little better. Then, boing, back to the suffering, okay. Start clapping, start clapping al hate, you know. Start, start ba- when, now, now we'll do tshuva. That's idea number one. Idea number two, people ask, where was God during the Holocaust? Where was God? Oh, great philosophical question. Where was Hashem during the Holocaust? I mean, the answer is it was exactly where German jury put him. German jury put him out of the picture. You don't, want, you don't want God in the picture, so God steps out. You have, you have uh, one, one, one sheep among 70 wolves, and the shepherd... You, you tell the shepherd, listen, I don't need your uh, sheep says to the shepherd, can you leave? Shepherd's like, you know, I don't think it's such a great idea. You know, I, I don't think it's a great, no, 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 okay, I, I can handle it on my own. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I want, I, 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 I like, I want to set to reform. I want to reform things. The shepherd said, okay, you know, and then he gets ripped to pieces. He gets ripped to shreds. When people ask, where was Hashem during the Holocaust? Where was Hashem during the Holocaust? <laughs> Gentlemen, we are surrounded by a world we are the sheep among 70 wolves. The only reason they don't rip us apart is because Hashem is constantly with us. Otherwise, they'd be ripping, ripping us to shreds. So you push Hashem out of the picture. All he's doing is leaving the world to its natural running. That's all he did. Left the world to the natural state. The natural state is let's rip the Jews apart. So if 
a person understands that in the Holocaust, so you have all these terrible stories. What about talk to somebody who survived? Read books about survivors from the Holocaust. Every single one of them you'll see has a story that doesn't make any sense. They were lying under a pile of bodies for three days, and he was hiding in a barn by some by some uh, Polish peasant, hid him in a barn for a year and a half. You know, all, the, all these stories. That means that Hashem is saying over here, there'll be the, the calamities, but there's going to be blessing among the calamities. There's going to be bracha. Where's the bracha? Those individuals who all experience bracha. And if you really want to understand where you want to see Hashem, say, ask any one of those people because their whole life doesn't make any sense. We had a guy in Chicago, by the way. The guy in Chicago was a, uh, I knew he was an older guy. He was a, he was a European, European guy. So he said that he was in the, he, he was a, a, like a 17-year-old yeshiva bacher. I think, he, I think he was in, I don't know where he was, in Poland or in a, where, where he was. He was a 17-year-old. And, uh, you know, things were getting hot. And so he had a change. He was walking around in peasant's clothing. And he was just trying to just trying to survive. And he was just sitting in a bar and just trying to blend in. And another guy sidles up to him in the bar, and this guy says to him, Mode Ani. So he got nervous, you know, because the Germans did stuff like that. The Germans trying to flush out Jews, they sometimes go up to say, somebody say, Shalom Aleichem. You know, if the Jew answered it, that was it. So he didn't know. So this guy sidles up to him, and he says, Mode Ani. So he says to him, Lefanecha. So it turned out the guy was from the partisans, and he and there was, you know, he took him into the forest and he survived the war with the, with the partisans. Somebody once asked this guy, how come you did it? Why did you, I mean, it, you had a 50-50 chance here. Why, why did, when the guy said Modani, you know, he could have just ignored him and he would have stayed at the status quo. Why would you willing to take that chance? And it was a big chance, the life or death chance. Why are we willing to take that chance? He said, I remember the guy saying with a smile, the guy said, listen, when I hear Modani, I say Lefanecha. You know, there's just something you do. I don't, you know, what I hear. My guy says, Modani. I say, Lefanach. There's the way it is. No, no rational reason. That's the, that's, that's the bracha. Because Rocco rescues him. He could have just as easily been, could have been so easily not, not made it out. Okay, that's the first idea. Now, go to Pasuk Ches. Sorry, Pasuk, Pasuk, what did I say? Pasuk Ches? Pasuk Tes. Um, no, Pasuk Yud Tes. Pasuk Yud Tes. Okay. Page 1092. Okay, completely different topic now. The Torah says like this. Uh, it's about uh, six lines from the bottom. Fascinating idea here. Moshe Rabbeinu says to the Jewish people, six lines from the bottom. Ha'idosi v'chem hayom, I call to witness today. Es ha'shamayim ve'es ha'aretz, the heavens and the earth. Ha'chayim ve'amoves nasati lefanecha. I have put life and death in front of you. Ha'brochavekla, the blessing and the curse. Ubacharta b'chaim, choose life. L'mantichi ha'tavizarecha, choose life that you and your children should live. All right, gentlemen, you know, if you put out a stake in front of me, if you put out a stake and you put out some sushi and you tell me, choose the good one, All right? Chasvis, chasvis sushi, right? The, the, say, pick the good one. I, what do you think I'm going to pick? You know, if you put out steak, you put out some cottage cheese, all right? For, uh, put out some steak, put out some cottage cheese. Which one do you think I I need you to tell me to pick the steak? You put out a $100 bill and you put out a one shekel, no, uh, a 10 shekel note. There are none. <laughs> they're, they're, that's how good they are. You put out a $100 bill and a 100 shekel note. Tell me, pick the good one. Pick the good one. I need you to tell me to pick the good one. You tell me you could choose. Now pick the right one. <laughs> you know, I've always been a big fan of Ben Franklin. You know, so so what do you what, what why is it the why do you have life and death afraid? Choose life. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? That's pretty obvious. So why is the Torah telling you to choose life? Number one. So the 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 before should say like this. It doesn't mean choose it. It means this is the result of choosing it. Ubacharta b'chayim doesn't mean the Torah says, choose life. I know that I should do that. If you have a chance to stand on the train platform or jump in front of the rushing train, I don't need somebody to say, well, stay on the platform. Don't jump in front of the rushing train. Yes, I know. Don't jump in front of the rushing train. To avoid that rundown feeling, do not jump in front of rushing trains. Yes, I know that. So why does the Torah say, ubacharta b'chayim? The Torah is telling you this is the result. 
Ubacharta Bachayim, you shall choose life when you choose life, if you choose life. Then you and your children will live. Well, again, it sounds that if I live, my children will. It's telling you that if you want to enjoy and experience life at its fullest, choose life the way the Torah tells you to choose life. If you choose to live in ways that are not consistent with Torah, your life is not going to be much of a life. Your life is going to be consumed by trying to find some sort of sense of fulfillment or purpose or whatever it is. Your life will not be a life. The Torah says, Ubacharta b'chaim. Choose life. Choose to live life properly. Not that you should choose to live versus dying, because that's pretty obvious, number one. Number two, here's a bonus for you. This is the good news. The Torah is telling you, Ubacharta b'chaim means, imagine you wake up in the morning. Well, that takes some imagination. But imagine you wake up in the morning. You actually wake up, and you wake up at 7 o'clock. Remember, into science fiction here, I know. But you wake up at 7 o'clock in the morning, and now comes the battle. Should I go daven with dominion or not daven with dominion? Right? The, you know, the battle. I told you, gentlemen, don't make, the choice, or don't make the choice horizontal. Don't make the choice while you're horizontal. Then it's a, you're, 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 that, that's, that, it, you're, there's no free choice there. If you're horizontal, don't choose a, get vertical. Then make the choice. Get for it. So it's a very, it's a simple piece of advice. I heard this once from Rabbi Tatz many years ago. And I still use it for myself. Sometimes, you know, you wake up in the morning, you're a little bit like slodgy. You know, head's not clear. You know, I think I'm going to sleep for another five minutes, which turns out into two hours. Right? Now, you know, before you make that decision, get vertical. I know, I know. That's also, that's also not so easy. Just sit up in bed and, and, and sit up in bed for a second. Think about a cup of coffee. Think about washing your face with some cold water. Just think about it. You know what? Let me try that. If you if you if you're making the decision horizontal, forget about it. You're you're, you're finished. You're, I mean, even you're finished. So you choose to go to Dominion, and you actually do it. You get out of bed at seven o'clock. You have a cup of coffee. You do other drugs, whatever gets you through the day, and you actually make it to Dominion. You put on your tefillin. You put on your daven. I don't care what you just you go. Whatever. Chas shalom. Not that I suspect anybody. And and you actually make it to Dominion. When does the clock, I once worked on a loading dock. One summer I worked on a loading dock. It was my, in high school. There was a, we were loading trucks, but we were learning a government food program. We had to load boxes on trucks all night. So I was working on this loading dock. So I noticed it's the first time I ever worked with a punch clock. And I noticed what everybody did, you got to down to the dock. The first thing anybody did is they took their card and punched it. First you punched the clock. Then they start, took off their coat, got some cigarettes, bought a cup of coffee. Yeah, that, that, you start working 10 minutes later. But the first thing is you punch that clock. Okay? You went to davening at 7 o'clock. You went to Minion. When did your clock for reward from God start? When does that clock start? So we think, yeah, I got the show. Okay, now, yeah, punch the clock. Says the Torah. The commentaries say, From the minute you make the choice, the clock starts. You're lying in bed, you chose to get out of bed, boom, the clock starts. Now everything is gravy. Now everything is gravy. You go to show, that's the reward. The reward, it's a, it's a freebie. We get the reward from the moment we make the right choice. You went to a shear, from the moment you chose to go to the shear, to get off that couch out in the hall, which I feel like burning on Lagba Omer, to, to get off that couch, put away the smartphone, and get up and go to shear, from the moment you made the choice, that's when the reward starts. And if you would have chosen sooner, or stayed in the room and learned, so they get even more reward. That's what the Torah says, Ubacharta Bachaim. I want to tell you something. I had a guy once in my neighborhood, Israeli, he was an Israeli Balchuva. And I knew he was in the Israeli Air Force. This guy had been flying F 16s, and he became a Balchuva. What's that? No, 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 no. He's a he's a diamond. This is a, this is an Israeli Balchuva. So this guy, I knew he was in the, he was in the, he had been, I knew he'd been in the Israeli Air Force. He became a Balchuva and he was the head of a Kolol and he became a Rov, he became a Posek. And one day I asked him after Shabbos how he became, what happened to him? I mean, you're in the Israeli Air Force. You, you've you made, you're at the pinnacle of success in Israeli society. Now it used to be. Now it's a, it's the, uh, the what do you call it? It's the, it's, it's, it's the computer guys. What's it called? 8000, the unit 8000 that, you know, blows up cities. But they, uh, uh, what do you call it? it? used to be, you know, the Air Forces, you know, mm, they used to, there was, a, there was a saying in Hebrew, uh, uh, an expression, hatovim latayis. The best ones go to the Air Force. The best ones go to the Air Force. 
So one day I asked him what happened. How did he become a Balchuva? I'm curious, the guy for the pilot, you know, you, you got it made. Why would he want to become a Balchuva? So this is the second one that I wondered about. The guy I wondered about most, by the way, was a guy who was a sports writer for the Washington Post. I think Washington Post, or I think Washington Post. He was a sports writer. And he became a Balchuva. So I asked the guy, what, what happened to you? What, 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 why did, he says, look, he, had, he was working a job and involved, being a sports writer involved getting in the business section of an airplane, flying to a city, staying at a five-star hotel, going to the basketball game, sitting in the press box, drinking beer and eating donuts, watching the game, and then pulling out a laptop and for two minutes writing who scored how many points, who got thrown out of the game, pushing a button, send, and then back to the hotel, back to the next city. Rough job, right? I said, to him, you gave that up? He said, yeah. I said, Is there still an opening? And I said, Could you imagine? Could you imagine? I, 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 you know, what, what better? And the guy gave it. He walked away from it. This guy was in the Air Force. I said to him, what happened? So he told me he grew up, he was born and raised on a secular, anti-religious kibbutz. And he had a steady diet of anti-religious propaganda. And one day on the kibbutz, there was a traffic accident. Three sets of parents were killed from the kibbutz. And a short time later, the daughter, a teenage daughter of one of those parents, she ended up going, leaving the kibbutz, and she went to a seminary and became a balas juva. So everybody in the kibbutz said, listen, only, only nutcases or emotionally, emotionally unhealthy people would become religious. She was obviously emotionally distraught because her parents were killed. And that was the end of the story. In the meantime, he went to the Air Force, became a captain, and he's flying F F-16s. One day, they get a, a, a year and a half later, two years later, they get an invitation that the kibbutz's girl's getting married to Yeshiva Bachar. She's from, she's getting married. The entire kibbutz is invited. The guy told me he was on his way with his buddies down to the, down to the wedding, and they're making jokes about Yeshiva Bacharols. I remember he used the expression, Yeshiva Bacharols. That's what they were calling them. Yeshiva Bacharols are a bunch of turtles in a shell. They don't know what's going on in the world. They're a bunch of draft dodgers. They, all they do, the, the usual tiresome litany. So he, he's on the way down talking about Yeshiva Bacharols. And they get to the wedding and they're still making jokes. And they get to the chuppah, they're still making jokes. And then they finish the chuppah, the chassan and kala go into the yichud room, and they're still making jokes. And at a certain point, the guy announces that the bride and groom are coming out. Get ready to greet the chassan and the kala. So he's standing there. He says, everybody in the room got up. All the yeshiva bachrim, the, the groom's friends, they stood on one side of the room. And his people, his kibbutz people, his family, all the psychos, they were standing on it. They were going to dance. They weren't involved with anything. They were just, you know, they're on the other side of the room. The guy told me he was standing there. Here he is in his captain's uniform. And he's looking at the two groups. And he takes a look at the contrast. And he thought to himself, I'll say it in Hebrew, Zechai v'zemet. He said, this group is alive and this group is dead. Nobody told him, nobody convinced him, nobody argued. He just took a look at the contrast between the, the faces and the enthusiasm, the, the entire approach of the yeshiva guys and all his people, all of his people. And he said to himself, they're living and they're dead. I want to live. He told me he made the decision to become from on the spot. He went right there on the spot. Now, there happened to be a guy there. He told me there was an Israeli headhunter. One of these McCarvers, you know, one of these, one of these guys who, who's looking to draw people, you know, make people from. He was at this wedding also, and he saw the eyes lit up. These guys are good. These guys are, should be with. Yeah. So he zoomed in for the kill. Yeah. He's a, he said the guy zoomed in for the kill, and the guy was disappointed because the guy started telling him, "Listen, I can prove to you there's a God." He said, "I don't need proof. Just tell me how do I keep shops." No, no, I can prove to you. Torah is. You know, I said, "I don't need proof." The guy was he took all out of jab said it. There was no argument. He expected an argument, a fight. You know, I'll convince the guy. The guy, the decision was made on the spot. That's who bechar to bechaim. choose life. Lamantichi atavazrecha. Choose life. Okay, that's as far as nitzavim. Uh, we have to do a little bit of vayelech, by the way. Let's go on because we got a double header this week. So. Um, by the way, uh, there, there's another, there was, sorry, sorry, there's another idea here, very important, very important of before we go on. Ubacharta, you notice at the end of the Pesach, it says, Ubacharta b'chayim l'man tichya ata v'zarecha. Choose life that you and your children should live. Rav Moshe Feinstein says, choose life means choose to follow the Torah in a way that your children will also want to follow the Torah. And what that means is that with the environment in the home, 
and not in just the environment. The entire attitude and approach of the, of the parents is going to affect their children's Yiddishkeit. If I'm doing the mitzvahs, and all I do is fetch about how hard it is to do the mitzvahs, my kids see it. They say, well, what, you know, why would we want to be involved in that? If the father's always going, ah, children cost so much, and the rabbi just talks too long in shul, and his whole Yiddishkeit is one series of complaining. So then what, kind of, what are the kids going to absorb? All the kids are going to absorb is that Yiddishkeit is a pain. If the parents are enthusiastic, and if the father says, listen, we're going to give tzedakah, I love giving tzedakah, and, and there's a different attitude, so then it's, that you and your offspring should live. There's a famous story with Ramosha Feinstein. There were two men who came to the United States, and they refused to work on Shabbos. You know, back in the 30s, 40s, it was a tremendous pressure. You didn't work, you got fired from your job. A lot of people, and that... And there are many people, unfortunately, who could not withstand that test. They worked on Shabbos. They had no choice. There were men who went to shul in the morning, Shabbos morning. They were from men. They went to shul Shabbos morning, and then they got into their car. They had to take the subway, go to, what do you call it, to go to work. Because they felt that they, they had no choice. There were others who held out. They held out. They got fired every week, and they held out. And it was very difficult for a period of a few years. So somebody once asked for a bunch of Feinstein. There were two men who did not work on Shabbos. They kept Shabbos. One of them, his children all became very, very fine Torah Jews, completely devoted to Judaism. The other one, his kids were come, come religious. And they asked Ramon Shafaiti, what happened? They both sacrificed for Shabbos. What, 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 what was different? Ramon Shafaiti said, I knew the two men. The first man said, you know what? It's Shabbos. It's Hashem Shabbos. This is what we have to do. We're happy to do it. And that was the, invite. That was the attitude his kids picked up. The second guy came home. He also gave up. But he came home and he said, It's hard to be a Jew. And it's hard to... And he was always complaining. So a kid hears the father complaining about being Jewish. So why, you know, why would I want to do that? Why, why would I want to follow? So the Torah says, keep the mitzvahs in a way that your kids are going to enjoy it. Keep the mitzvahs in a way that it enthuses your children. You and your children should live. Okay. One more point. Take a look. In Rashi. This is extremely important, gentlemen. Um, the Rashi begins uh, two lines from the bottom. Haidosi be, right column. If you find it, please show the person next to you. Haidosi bechem hayom es hashemayim ve'es I am calling the heavens and earth as witness against the Jewish people. What does it mean? What does that mean? What do you mean the heavens and earth are going to be witnesses? What does it mean? Heavens, what's that? Forever. Forever. They're always around. And they are not only the witnesses, they're the ones who are going to determine whether or not what, what the pay is. It's going to rain and it's going to produce because we're good. It's not going to rain and the product, the, the, the produce is going to go rotten because we're bad. You understand? The heavens and the earth, not only they're the witnesses, they're the ones who carry out the judgment. So the heavens and the earth, and they're always around. By the way, the, what's the guy called in, he, in, in, in a shul? The guy in shul who takes care of the shul. What's he called? The Gabbai is the guy who calls up the Elias. The guy who arranges the shelves in the, in the what's he called? The Shamish. The Shamish. Any Hebrew word that sounds familiar connected to Shamish? Shamish, which is the sun. Why is the sun, why is the Shamish and Shemesh the same? Because the sun is the most reliable worker. He always shows up on time. The sun shows up at, always at sunrise. He's there every day. He's very reliable. That's why it's called the Shamish. Now, look at Rashi. Rashi says, Shame, Haidosi Bechamayom es Hashemayim Vesa'oret. Says Rashi, Shehem Kayomim Laolam. They're around forever. Exactly what Moshe said. Number one, they're very good to have as witnesses because they're around forever. But look, look, look what else. The Kasher Tikore Eschem Hara, when anything bad happens, you Eidim Shani Sreisi Bashachem Cholot. They'll testify that I warned you. They'll be around to say, Yeah, I told you, you told you so. Okay, then he says something else. Dover Acher. Haidosi Bachem Ayomes Ashabayim. You know why? Omar Lehem Akorish Borchul Isra Hashem said to Jewish people, He staklu Bashamayim Shabarasi Lashamish Hashem. Look at the heavens that I've created to serve you. Shema Shinu. Did the heavens ever change their role? Did they ever change their job? 
Shema lo ola galgal chama mina mizrach vehir lekolam. Did the sun ever not rise in the east and shine for the whole world? Keinian shenem ar vezorach Hashem shu bo Hashem. It says in Kohelis, the sun will shine and the sun will arrive and it will shine. He staklu bo oretz. Look at the land shebarasi l'shamish. Look at the earth. Shema shin samidasa. Did the earth ever change? Did it ever veer off of its job? Shema Zorata Mosa Velosamcha, did you ever plant crops and they didn't rise, they didn't grow? Oh, Shema Zorata Mechitim Velosarb, did you ever plant wheat and the wheat turned into barley? In other words, they did their jobs. So Rashi concludes and says, if these, the heavens, the earth, the plants, the crops, they're serving without any intent for reward or punishment, so Atem Shem Zachisab Tekabu Schar, if you merit, you get rewarded, and if you sin, you'll be punished. Allah has come of a kama. All the more so. What's Rashi say? Heavens, the earth, the crops, everybody, everybody's, everybody's doing their job. What's Rashi saying? So I think there are two things here. Idea number one, he says, the heavens are always doing, they're steady, and they never do the, they never change, they never veered off. You planted wheat, it came out as wheat, never came out as barley. You ever notice that? You plant wheat, it comes out as wheat. You plant barley, comes out of barley. If you take leftovers and put them in the freezer, they're going to taste like leftovers even when you come and take them out of the freezer. People think if you freeze it, so then it comes back to life. Yeah, it'll be a resurrection of the dead. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. You take for leftovers, you put it in the freezer, you're going to take out what you, you're going to take out what, you, what, what, what goes in, comes out. You freeze it fresh, it's going to taste fresh. I know well because I, I don't do leftovers. Uh, no, let's not let's not let's not go there at all. Right? But at the at the end of the day, what goes in, that's what's going to come out. Wheat never becomes barley. What's it? What, why, why, why is Rashi giving us all these examples? I mean, I got it from heavens and earth. Why are you giving us? You know, it was a little more sophisticated. Why are we giving all these examples? The answer is number one: all these things do their job steadily. That's a requirement of us. It's all about steady. It's not about one time here and one time there. It's about consistency. There's got to be consistency. There's got to be consistency. You can't, you can't show up at work one day and then take off and go. Yiddish guide is consistent. It's tefillin every day. It's tzitzis every day. It's davening every day. It's not eating pork every day. It's not talking lush and hard. It's consistency, number one. Number two, you have a role, and you have a role, and I have a role to play. Everybody has a role to play. If you're wheat, you're not going to be barley. If you're Heavens, you're not going to be the earth. You're not going to, don't change, don't try to do somebody else's job. I, 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 there's a story, I think I heard this from Rabbi Salinger originally. I'm not sure, maybe it makes it. Was there a guy, anybody ever hear of Tuscanini? Anybody ever hear of Tuscanini? <laughs> I, I was worried about that, yeah. Well, Tuscanini was apparently a concert, uh, if I'm thinking of the right guy, the conductor, he was a conductor, a very a famous, if it's Tuscanini, I think it's Tuscanini. So if it's not, you don't know anyway, so I could tell you it is, right? because anyway, you don't know. So uh, you, who's the premier of China, by the way? I didn't know that either, right? Oh, yeah, right. So I can say anything that I want. Oh, somebody got, somebody actually knows. So I, I could just say one Yang Gang, and you're like, oh, oh, wow, he's so sophisticated. You don't know that it isn't. Okay, so this guy was apparently a conductor. And he was listening to a recording of an orchestra of a piece that was being played. And he was listening to some, with somebody else. And he says to this other guy, and this guy, remember, these guys got a strange ear. They hear these guys are, they, they, they're, they're made, they're wired differently than the rest of us. And he says to the guy, hmm, that piece is meant to be played by 14 violins. There's one violin missing. Supposed to be 14 violins and there's one violin missing. You know the story? Uh, that one, one violin is missing. What's that? Yeah, one violin is missing. And he says, come on, come on, come on. 13 violins, 14 violins. I mean, would you be able to tell the difference between one? I mean, I go, come on. And this is a recording of the thing. He says, I'm telling you, one of those violins, I wrote this piece and that piece is written for 14 violins and there's one violin missing. So he says, it can't be. He checks it out and it sure enough that turned out that that day, the 14th violin player had called in sick. He never showed up, so they played it with 13 violins. So pressing, now you're thinking to yourself, does it really matter? I mean, does this violin, one, one more, one less, does it matter what he contributes? Does it really matter? The answer is yes. And the answer is that every single one of us matters. 
And you think to yourself, does my learning Gemara condition really matter? I mean, a lot of guys in Mirror are learning it. A lot of guys in Panovich are learning. Does my davening really matter? Does my yes? The answer is that the Jewish people are one big orchestra, and your violin and your contribution and your davening and your tefillin, yeah, it all matters. It all, if it's not there, it's missing from the entire the entire piece. Does not play the same way, and that's what the Torah is telling you over here. Everybody, you're a wheat, you're a barley, whatever you are. Do your role. Don't try to do somebody else's role. And we have to do our thing consistently. That's what the Torah wants from us. Okay, we have to stop here.